a Chinese plan to invade Taiwan. They were trying to get the information which they need for an invasion. Is that it? It could be Taiwan, it could be Japan, could be the Philippines too. Um, the, I think the most disturbing piece of evidence here is that the Chinese wanted radar in Okinawa. And one of the sailors, Thomas Zhao, actually provided for it, provided that. And that really means that they are looking at what they can do in an attack on Japan or Taiwan, because an attack on Taiwan will inevitably result in an attack on Okinawa as well. I'm curious about your thoughts, your concern uh, over the other direction. So Chinese uh, aggressive investment in the U.S. and in, in everything from farmland to uh, mining operations, their efforts to influence uh, local regulatory policies uh, at the state and federal level, as well as their efforts to influence uh, our neighbors in our own region and Central America and Honduras is a perfect example in recent uh, months. Yeah, sure. Well, they do, um, you know, I think CFIUS. Yeah. The lack of an overarching regional security order in the Indo-Pacific. China's economic and political influence in its own geographic neighborhood is described as a security challenge. It urges the EU to prepare a strategy that would allow us to react if sh against China. It talks about increasing our joint efforts in capability development, building up EU military power to, to be a credible security actor in the region. And all of this to protect our security interests. Could we ever open an atlas? And could it tell me, what is it about Europe that entitles us to speak this way about an entire region of the world with 60% of the world's population as if it belonged to us, as if it was still a colonial backyard of Europeans? This isn't the 19th century. The European Union isn't in a position to boss around the rest of the world. We really seriously need a change in direction. Well, everybody, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. My name is Alex here with Reportify Media, and I'm here with Cyrus Jansen. Cyrus, it's been a while. Welcome it's, back. It's been a while, brother. <laughs> How are you? Good to see you. Doing great. Lots to lots to cover uh, over the next hour here. Um, what you been up to, Cyrus? I see a couple of videos come up in your channel just recently. What's going on? Yeah, well, you know, just still kind of organizing a lot of videos for my recent China trip. So as, as you know, uh, we, as many fans of the channel and people that follow us together, you know, uh, had a chance to go back to China uh, last month, had a wonderful visit, had a chance to meet Alex in person for the first time there in Shanghai. And, you know, it's uh, we're really, uh, really excited because there's there's a lot of things going on, I think, in the United States China relationship that I focus on. Um, you know, I think one of the things that, that's so important in today's live stream, Alex, is this is a constant thing that I'm hearing in the United States is that every single day media is doubling down. Media is doubling down and saying that, you know, China is the biggest threat to the future of the United States. And I think, you know, we you know we have a lot of things that we want to share about this because I think people need a, a different perspective about this. You know, we, we, you know, constantly when you, you know, you get people like Gordon Chang, who is, is just one of the most extreme people in the world with his views on China. Um, I don't think you can find someone as extreme as Gordon Chang and really lacks a lot of rational thinking, really lacks a lot of in-depth thinking. And, uh, you know, and unfortunately that is just what the United States media has become. You know, it has just become... Um, just this swamp of just deadly information where people are just, you know, there's no control, there's no filter. And uh, to be honest, the average American is completely confused on what's really happening in the world. And I think that's what's great about having a YouTube channel and being able to share independent views. And I think that's why, you know, most Americans, it's quite interesting because their overall impression of the media in the United States is declining. You know, we, we in general, in America, we don't really trust the media at all. We don't really trust the government at all. But yet it is interesting when we talk about China, it does seem like everybody gets on board and, and kind of uh, will listen to anything that's being spewed on the television, most, most namely a person like Gordon Chang, who just doesn't lack really any valuable insights at all. And I mean, he just has, he has nothing to add to the table. And we're going to break that down in today's stream. I think it comes down to, you know, responsibility. And that, that's gone, that, that left a long time ago. I mean, we are seeing, you know, the mainstream media is actually losing its relevance. To be to be honest with you, Cyrus, I've di disconnected from the mainstream media. And if, you know, I want some talking points or if I want some, uh, you know, 
interesting intros to our talk show, all I have to do is just get head over to uh, YouTube, fire up Fox News and put China in front of it. And there you right. go. It's ready and available for you. But I mean, this does come with consequences uh, because, you know, people used to have that trust and now that trust is broken. And we see a lot of the mainstream media uh, dissolving. Uh, look at the actors. The actors now, you might think, okay, wh why do we care about the actors? Well, the whole business model is changing for media as well. And I'll try to break that down for the audience if they don't really get where I'm going with this. But back in 1996, uh, music had a revolution happen. Uh, uh, MP3 programs came in, they replaced compact discs, CDs, uh, uh, you, you name it, cassette right. tapes, it was all replaced. Now that business model then shifted into Apple, that, which then shifted into uh, companies like uh, uh, Spotify. Now, Spotify knows who its audience are, how old they are, men, women, you know, what country they live in, what do they listen to? They are so intelligent that they understand that, hey, wait a moment, there's a band that was popular in 1985, uh, we have an audience for it, they will be so smart that they will be able to go to that artist and say, okay, wait a minute, Here, here's some money, get back into the studio, we know you got fans. Now, that is reading the analytics. The analytics on the traditional media is gone. You're seeing people like Tucker Carlson just the other day, one of the most successful streams uh, in, in uh, I think, history. Uh, you're seeing, you know, Megyn Kelly. Now, these might not all be names that you want to watch, but this is shifting, and we are seeing a massive shift. Just with the shift of Hollywood going to Netflix, everybody's getting upset. It's breaking the, the business model. Well, in this media, it's disruptive. And now we have people like the Duran, people like Brian Berletic, Cyrus mm -hmm. Jansen, of course, and many other names. I mean, I think, uh, you know, over the next year or two, with all the, the news that has come out and, you know, the lack of trust, we are going to see, you know, quite an explosion here uh, on the mainstream media if they let us have our voice. I'm going to hand that back over to you to deal with, Cyrus. No, that's uh, you, Alex. You brought up a really good point because I think you know we started seeing this really. Um, well, it's interesting. I think it really started uh, in in early two thousand, right during the COVID pandemic. You know, I mean, we saw we started seeing. Um, I mean, this was really the rise of, of of various Chinese YouTube channels. I mean, I've been doing YouTube for three years now, and I know you know. Shout out to many of the followers who have been here for the entire journey, and you know, supporting. I mean, you know, Alex, you and I, we met you know virtually, you know, online. Uh, through COVID, you know, I mean, we, we started mm -hmm. making videos together, but it was, it was interesting because I think what had happened is, is there was so much, there was so much disinformation. There was so much misinformation during COVID. And a lot of people were, you know, I mean, at that point, China really started getting blamed for so many things. And so many people really wanted to understand, you know, what is the truth that's going on in China? You know, I think what a lot of people don't realize is that d right during the middle of the COVID pandemic, you know, from kind of June 2020 through, you know, August, September 2021. I mean, there was a really great, you know, 15 month span where, where COVID was essentially non-existent in China. The kind of the economy was booming. Everybody was traveling domestically. Um, I mean, I have so many friends and expats that are in China and they're just like, man, we're living our best life. Like we are living an unbelievable life in China right now. The only thing we can't do is we can't leave the country, you know, and, and, and anybody that comes in is subjected to a 21 to 28 day quarantine. But, you know, domestically, tourism was booming, the streets were packed, and that was right when most of the world was, you know, under lockdowns. I mean, in Canada, where I was at, I mean, it was, you know, strict lockdown for a long time, QR codes to scan in to get anywhere, um, you know, very strict policies, mandatory vaccines as well, which was never implemented in China. So, I mean, it was quite interesting, you know, just all of these information. I mean, and I think that's kind of the start of these YouTube channels. But, you know, Alex, as you remember during that time, you know, we had Meng Wanzhou, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, that was that was an entire catastrophe. I mean, you're a Canadian citizen as well. Mm. My wife and children are Canadians. Uh, that's why we were living in Canada. I mean, it was interesting. I mean, because that's that's what we started seeing is I started going down to the courthouse in Vancouver and making these independent videos, you know, interviewing, uh, you know, standout lawyers like Richard Curland, you know, who I mm -hmm. was able to interview with you. But also I met him on this, you know, the street on the right outside the steps of the Vancouver Supreme Courthouse. And it's just getting this raw footage from, you know, an ordinary civilian who's kind of turned into this YouTuber slash, you know, rep uh, reporter, you know, media figure, whatever you want to say. But, you know, that's that's where I think it's becoming very powerful. And like you said, I mean, look at Tucker Carlson, you know, he 
you know, has a falling out with Fox News. Um, you know, he had the number one syndicated, you know, TV show in America. Mm-hmm. And I mean, he, you know, he brought in 4 million views, uh, you know, every time that he would, you know, go on air. What's incredible though, Alex, is you see a guy like Joe Rogan, you know, Joe Rogan is bringing in four times that amount, 16 million views per episode of his, of his podcast. So when you really talk about even Tucker Carlson achieving tremendous success on television, you know, this is a reason why uh, Joe Rogan has, you know, a um, hundred million dollar deal with Spotify. I mean, he moves the needle. I mean, he is the needle. Right. I mean, he could really uh, do that. And, and a lot of people will criticize Joe Rogan. Well, he's not an expert in this field. He's not that. He's not this. But, you know, that's what people want is m- something much more genuine and interested. You know, I mean, look at what the work that you've done in Chongqing, really putting that city on the map. I mean, in fairness, I lived in China for seven years. I never made it out to Western China. I never, you know, the far, farthest west I went was Kunming uh, and Yunnan province. That's the farthest west I've been. I've never made it out to Chongqing or Chengdu. Uh, sorry, I did make it to Chengdu. I did do a business trip there once. Um, I never made it to Chongqing. never made it to your city. But I mean, it's it's. I think people are really understanding that. You know, Alex, every day I wake up and I look at, you know, various YouTube comments. And I, I kind of, it's kind of where the interesting point where if you say something positive about China, inevitably it's like well you're an agent of china you're paid by the ccp you're a ccp shill just if you say anything positive about china and and i think that's a really dangerous point in society because there's a lot of things that are positive about china there's a lot of things there's a lot of good things that are happening there and i think there's a lot of things that many chinese people can be proud of i mean how they've risen in the last 50 years is nothing short of remarkable I think what the Chinese government has done, you know, bringing hundreds of millions of people out of poverty can't be overlooked. And let's be let's be fair and, and balanced is the fact that there certainly there's many things that we can criticize as well. You know, but it's it's just that if it's 100 percent criticism and there's nothing good spoken, then it's not an objective view either. You know, we've got to have a balance there. And, you know, and it's and it's difficult for me as well as an American citizen, because, you know, as a citizen of the United States, I mean, we have a government that has made tremendous amount of mistakes, um, you know, when it t- comes to human rights, when it comes to, um, you know, continuing, you know, just a tremendous amount of policies that we do around the world that are unethical. And, and you know, I mean, <laughs> it's very difficult, I think, as an American citizen, you know, you've got to you've got to take care of your own house first. And you know, the United States has a tremendous amount of problems that are that we're going through as well. And not to say that China's not as well. I mean, China has a lot of issues that they're dealing with. So I think what we're really trying to do, Alex, is just try to be more rational and more balanced. And I think that's why a lot of people do enjoy the videos that we put out so we can get a little bit more realistic, you know, insight into China. And, you know, and what I try to do always is foster a better relationship between the U.S. and China. Mm, Thank you for that, Cyrus. I mean, last year I put, since arriving uh, last year, I put out 164 productions while I was here showing pretty much every part of uh, the the city uh, part of the you know the counties uh, the um, you know the culture uh, whether it's business whether it's news I mean we tried to cover everything um, with the team here now you mentioned something about you know America needs to clean up its house but you know what it was really troubling is when you start to see the amount of money going uh, offshore to other nations around the world and you see all this, you know, disproportionate uh, people that are, are struggling. I mean, the Bank of England uh, just recently raised its rates again. And I think what the audience hasn't seen yet is what happens when you see a consecutive uh, rate increase of uh, you know lending rates, mortgages go up. We're, we will start to see that impact probably the first quarter of uh, 2024. Yeah. Now, this is going to make the election year very interesting because when that starts to reset mortgages, unless there's uh, you know a panic button where the administration says, "Wait a minute, we know this is coming. Uh, this is a ticking time bomb. How do we avoid this?" It's where if these mortgages, well, they, they, they are going to reset. It's not a, if they are. And we had Peter Schiff on uh, a couple uh, a couple of months ago right. talk about yeah. this. You're going to see people's uh, mortgage payments. Let's say I, I've got an example. I've got, I know a couple that uh, lives in Vancouver, Canada, uh, from where you're from. Oh, yeah. uh, they bought a, a modest house, a uh, 30-year mortgage. I think their monthly rate was about fourteen to 1600 Canadian a month. Okay. Yeah. And now 
they're looking at a twenty eight hundred dollar to three thousand month payment. Yeah, with the reset. And and you know what's interesting, Alex? In Canada, that you cannot lock in, uh, you can't lock in those rates, right? I think the maximum that you can lock in a, a mortgage rate would be five years, and then yeah. after five years, it'll be up for you know basically renewal. And and that that is an advantage in the U.S. U.S. at least you can lock in. You can get a thirty year fixed mortgage, and hopefully at the you know at the height of COVID when mortgage rates were almost zero percent, a lot of people locked that in, which was great. But now it's completely you know now mortgages are five, six, seven percent. And I mean, I have a buddy of mine that's uh, up in Whistler, Canada, which is a very, uh, very difficult market to buy a house in. But he's he had a friend at a bank who gave him the lowest rate. So he's mm -hmm. like, wow, I've got basically, you know, three years left. So I've just I just hope this will sort out because if, you know, if, if I mean, that, that's the interesting thing. I mean, he's like, OK, I've got a, a payment of this, but if it were to re if it were to expire you know tomorrow and we had to renew, we could potentially look at like doubling our, our mortgage payment. You know, it would just yep. be insane. That's a house of cards when you think about it. It's a house of cards. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it could collapse. Now, I want to get into something here in the program here, and I'm going to tee up your uh, – when you're ready, Cyrus, when you're ready, yeah. we'll tee up your um, cards that we got before the show here. Sure. But I want to show um, – just to set the tone on where I think the U.S. economy is focused right now, okay? And I trade these financial markets. I've been trading these financial markets for over 25 years. I'm a derivative trader. Uh, as soon as I leave here, I head onto the trading screens at night. And I've been doing that for about 20 years. And I've always seen uh, a pattern go in these markets. This one here is the most troubling that I've seen here. Now, I'm going to start it off by showing this slide to the audience here. Now, this will have some relevance to what I'm talking about here. This is the U.S. military presence around the world. 750 bases in 80 countries, 100 and I believe that's 73,000 troops that were deployed in 159 countries. Where has the U.S. Uh, bombed since World War II? Korea, China, Guatemala, Indonesia, Afghanistan, Yugoslavia, Afghanistan again, Iraq, Pakistan, Somalia, Yemen, Libya, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So where am I going with all this? Well, I want to talk about one of the biggest companies uh, in uh, the United States right now. And if you don't think this company is ready, they're ready. Okay. This is BlackRock. Now, BlackRock, of course, has the traditional holdings of NVIDIA, Apple, you know, the traditional things that you'd want to have in your long-term strategy, PG&E, Coca-Cola, pretty much, you know, your, your standard uh, mill um, companies. But I think what the public isn't understanding is visualizing BlackRock, uh, and understanding that it has $9 trillion under management, assets under management, $9 trillion. Just to wrap your head around that, the U.S. economy does $24 trillion annually. Right. Now, I'm not, gonna be, I'm not going down the conspiracy hole here because there is some truth to this. Okay? And it... The picture gets a little bit uglier from here, all right? And this is where I think we have wound up with a massive geopolitical issue here that is not going to unwind itself. Everybody thinks this conflict in the, in the Ukraine and Russia is going to be over maybe a month, two months. That country, we have, a, we, we have Patrick Lancaster, who ha was on your show. Uh, great uh, interview if you guys haven't seen it. Uh, it's called An American in Ukraine, something like that, on your channel, yeah. Sire. Fantastic interview. Patrick Lancaster is a friend of mine. He's been down in that area for quite some time. And he's telling me, even if everything stopped tomorrow, we are talking decades of rebuilding. Decades, okay? Yeah. He says, even if there is a demilitarized zone, uh, there's cleanup uh, on a biblical scale. Uh, the rebuilding is one process. And during the rebuilding, there's a massive amount of, uh, well, we'll call it loss of funds, okay? Anyway, I'm going to bring on to the next slide here. So BlackRock's investments are making a killing on killing. Mm. Uh, weapons manufacturing, military contractors, civilian firearm manufacturers, investment that fuel war, death, destruction on our streets and around the world. Investments in weapon companies, both military and civilian, run counter to BlackRock's statement about holding companies accountable to be good corporate citizens. For example, the top five military contractors in the US are Lockheed Martin, biggest shareholder is, no surprise, BlackRock. Uh, Boeing, 
no surprise, top five shareholder, BlackRock. Raytheon, no surprise, top five shareholder, BlackRock. General Dynamics, Northrop, Grumman, all have numerous counts of waste and abuse of federal tax dollars. But it doesn't stop there, okay? We continue on, and we go on to see another slide. If you take Vanguard and BlackRock, by the year 2028, they will almost be at 80 to 85% of the U.S. annual economy in the oh, United geez. States. That's amazing. 20 trillion between them, BlackRock and Vanguard could almost, almost own everything by 2028. Now, to wrap this up, where I'm going with this is these companies are heavily invested. If you go back to this slide, they're invested in media. Yeah. Heavily invested in media. Matter of fact, Apple. You think Apple's not media? They're media. Yeah. You think Amazon's not media? They're media. Apple's platforms? Hmm. Well, let's see. Who finances these movies? Who finances this message? Who finances, you know, uh, the, well, you could just see what Disney stumbled in the last year. So let's continue on. So at the end of the day, when BlackRock is saying, well, okay, it's not really our problem. Uh, you know, we just invest in this companies. Well, then why are you guys showing up in the Ukraine with JP Morgan to set up a reconstruction fund? So not only are you supporting these arms, <laughs> but you benefited on the other side here. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's quite amazing that this happens. But this is the control here of a very, very powerful company that owns trillions of dollars in assets under management, that has control in the media, control with military weapons, control, I mean, we are talking a staggering amount of money here, Cyrus. These yeah. guys, if they want, if they want to go in and destabilize a country and say, all right, let's go into country ABC, uh, let's get the media going, no problem. Let's get the arms in there, no problem. Let's get the mercenaries in there, no problem. And if they want to do it, they can do it, and they are doing it. And that's what's troubling me. Uh, I'm going to pass that over to you. I just wanted to kind of share that segment with the audience. No, that's a really fascinating insight, Alex. And I always appreciate your insights into the financial market. Obviously, that's your main business, and you've been trading for 20, 30 years now. And I think it's, you know, the interesting thing is I always want to share, uh, you know, my perspective as a United States citizen that is living back here in the U.S. at the moment and I think what's 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 been very interesting is is I want everyone to remember, you know, I lived abroad for 15 years. And so I have a very interesting perspective on the United States because, you know, the last time I lived here full time was 2007, which was, you know, that was or actually 2006. In 2007, January, I moved to China. But, you know, from 2007 until, you know, basically 2022, I was, you know, living abroad 10 years in China, five years in Canada. And I came back to the United States last year, you know, for, for some personal reasons. You know, one, I wanted to be closer back to my parents as they're aging. I want them to be able to see their grandchildren. And, you know, two, I, I do feel that it's important to be on the ground kind of in the U.S. or China since that's mainly what I deal with, right? I deal with U.S.-China relations. And it's been actually very helpful for me, you know, running this YouTube channel to have a perspective of, of being here in the U.S. Because there's one thing that, you know, there's a lot of great things about the United States. But what's interesting is just talking to the local people here and really understanding like how the average American thinks, because I, I would have to say that our government in the United States is, you know, we we have absolutely the mastered the art of propaganda inside this country. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, I don't think there's another country in the world that can uh, that can even come close to how our government puts out propaganda and because we do it so subtly. And, and we do it and we mask it so well. But the interesting thing is that, you know, for example, when you, when you, you know, I, I live in Las Vegas right now. In Las Vegas, we have an Air Force base, Nellis Air Force Base, that is uh, very big. So it's a very large military presence in, in the state of Nevada, specifically in Las Vegas. So, you know, constantly at my children's school, you know, many of the parents there, they either work for the Navy, the Air Force, uh, military, Army, whatever it is, there's a, a lot of servicemen and women that are living here in Las Vegas. And what's interesting is, is that I have been able to chat with them, you know, and learn a lot about the U.S. military, our objectives and everything. And, you know, for example, um, you know, honestly, just yesterday we had one of the one of the women came over and she's a uh, former uh, Air Force pilot, uh, you know, graduated from MIT, uh, you know, brilliant woman, you know, and she she's a um, 
you know, Air Force pilot. And, and she was, we were talking about all of these fighter jets in the U.S. And she's like, all right, we've got the F-16s, we've got the F, um, you know, 18s, F-25s, F-35, F I think is our latest one. And, you know, and I'm just like, what is the cost of an F-16? And she's like, well, that one is, you know, kind of our classic one, right? The first one, you know, I think the first commission flight was 1981. So that's, you know, probably around, you know, around 20 million. But our most advanced one, you know, the F-35, I mean, we're talking, you know, a couple hundred million, you know, per a pop. And I mean, and it's just, and I'm like, so how many do we have? You know, it's like, oh, we've got just thousands, you know, I mean, we just have so much, so many of them. I mean, we're selling them to other countries. We're giving them away. We're, you know, actually we got to give a lot away to, you know, the Middle East, you know, we got them all over the place. And so it's like, it's quite amazing to see, you know, how much money we're just pouring out, you know, building the military. And, and, I, and I was just like, you know, it's kind of wild though, when you look at the streets of America and you look at a lot of these big cities now, LA, Portland, Seattle, um, I mean, you know, all of these very liberal cities, you know, that are honestly, I mean, the homeless, the homelessness problem is through the roof right now in the United States. I mean, it's just shocking to see, um, you know, to go to LA, I mean, and, and just walk down the streets of LA. I mean, it looks like a third world country. I mean, it looks awful. And, you know, I just see this paradox. It's like, wow, we're spending literally hundreds of millions of dollars on one single F-35 airplane. And, you know, yet we have so many domestic issues here, you know, like we could easily be funding, you know, bringing that back in and helping the actual people in the United States and solving, you know, really big issues here. But this is what I mean is that we don't, you know, the average American, they, you know, we've been taught in this country that when you see a fighter jet go by, it's like, that's the sound of freedom. You know, that's the sound of freedom right there. And, and I, and I mean, it's, and to me, it's just one of the biggest, biggest pieces of propaganda. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's one of the things that we hear constantly in the United States. It's quite amazing. I mean, every time, you know, before every sporting event, it's like, you know, let's take a moment on our servicemen who are fighting around the world to protect our freedoms here in the United States. And it's quite interesting because I'm always thinking, well, who's, who's threatening our freedoms, right? Like, you know, we're, we're a sovereign country. I mean, let's be honest, who's going to mess with the United States? I mean, geographically, we're the most blessed nation in the world. We've got two massive oceans to our left and right. I mean, you know, that really, <laughs> who's going to launch an, an, an amphibious attack with those oceans? I mean, that's almost impossible. You've got Canada to the north. You couldn't ask for a better neighbor than Canada. And you've got Mexico to the south, which, you know, Mexico's not doing anything. I mean, the United States is absolutely, um, <laughs> absolutely the most protected nation in the world and it's it's kind of this this thing that's installed in our culture of just like you know we need to be we need to be increasing the military budget you know it's now over a trillion dollars a year that we're spending on the military we need to keep funding these things because you know freedom 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 but it's interesting alex when you go from your perspective and you're looking at blackrock and vanguard where they're investing how they're making money and you know i had another naval uh, pilot, uh, actually a Top Gun, you know, a guy, a guy that was literally in the Top Gun Academy. He's just like, you know, Cyrus, uh, the, the Ukraine war is best case scenario for the United States. I'll just be flat honest because it, it's, we risk zero American lives. We can basically take on Russia, you know, using Ukraine for that. And my question to him, wow. as I said, well, what about the people in Ukraine? Like, like, like I'm, I've, I've been very vocal. I mean, I'm very clear that you know, I don't, I don't support what's going on in Ukraine, but I, I want a ceasefire. Like, I think that is by far the best thing that could happen is to get a ceasefire and, and end the people dying, you know, get this, get a re resolution. You know, as you always say, uh, um, Alex, I'm the ambassador of peace, or I yeah. always prefer peaceful uh, resolution. So, you know, I mean, what's interesting in that regards, Alex, is we saw uh, Saudi Arabia, they just hosted a huge peace talk summit with 40 countries around the world. And even Saudi Arabia came out and said, look, we can leverage our relationship because we have a relationship with Russia. We have a relationship with Ukraine. We have a relationship with China. We are kind of a neutral party. So if there's somebody that could, you know, you know, um, basically mediate this potential conflict and come up with a solution, I think it, you know, maybe Saudi Arabia can do it. And, you know, and it's interesting because a lot of people in the West, you know, especially the Republicans, you know, um, you know, they're just like, no, the only the only option here is to continue. And, and we're going to fight until, you know, Putin is defeated and Russia is destroyed. That's that's the end of the war. And, you know, the, the problem with that is, as we know, this is a 
this is a war that, for example, for Russia, I mean, this is a war they cannot lose. So, I mean, it's not like they're going to retreat. I mean, they're they're going to fight to the death in this war. So, like you said, there is there is not going to be an end to this conflict within the next month, two months, three months. I mean, this is this is going to be a very long, prolonged event. So I think any kind of peace talks that are going there, it would be great. But it was just interesting to hear again that Top Gun, um, you know, fighter pilot who just said best mm. case scenario for us. And my question to him was, well, what about the people of Ukraine? Like that, you know, that country is getting wrecked. Like it is, ap- like you said, if they stop today, we're looking minimum twenty years to rebuild that country, and you know, possibly longer. I mean, it's Armageddon devastation in that country. And he's like, well. You know, it is what it is. You know, that's just, uh, you know, that's that's just that's just the nature of the game. You know, like, what can we do? You know, I mean, and and so I think it's, you know, it's 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 very interesting because, Alex, I want you to bring up one of my slides about the media. I want you to bring that slide up here because I think this is quite an interesting perspective. I want to share with that one. Yeah, let's go with the. um, Yep, exactly. So, I mean, I just want people to really understand this as far as, you know, this is an interesting thing that we talk about, right? Because we hear about, you know, China, uh, you know, America has this amazing advantage because we have free press and free media. And, you know, there's not a lack of uh, censorship. You know, there's no censorship, uh, you, you know, in the United States. It's a free and open thing, which in a minute I'll discuss that censorship thing. But share of U.S. adults that have a great deal quite a lot of confidence in newspapers and TVs as of 2022. So, I mean, we go back to, you know, we go back to 1993. I mean, 1993, Bill Clinton is in office. Um, I mean, America is kind of seen as a very, you know, very positive in that in that time. I mean, we're still under 50%, right? I mean, this is, you know, this is uh, incredibly, you know, that is, um, you know, 30 years ago, we're look, you know, where it's still 50%. But you look at TV news down to 11%. 11% of the population has confidence in the news as of 2022. You know, newspaper slightly higher at 16%. So what's interesting here, Alex, is that, you know, over the last 30 years, I mean, even again, 30 years ago, it wasn't really remarkably higher. Um, you know, it is interesting that, you know, 30 years ago, 46% to 31%, you know, that is yeah. quite a big difference there. But I mean, we've just seen a steady decline. And I think that goes back to the opening segment that we talked about, Alex, is that people are more interested in hearing independent journalism, you know, it, and that's, that is really the rise. And we've seen this from YouTubers. I mean, there's so many wonderful YouTubers out there creating a tremendous amount of, you know, uh, news stories. And, you know, you look at a guy like Patrick Lancaster, who's just mm-hmm. an American literally risking his life every single day on the ground, um, you know, filming content and giving that perspective. And I'll be the first to admit that I don't know a lot about the Russia Ukraine conflict. That's not an ex. that's not my area of expertise. Um, and that's why, you know, a year ago when I, when I sat down with him, I, it was more for me to learn. I just said, Hey, you're an American that's lived in the Donbass region since 2014. You speak Russian, you're there every single day on the streets. Your opinion absolutely value is valuable, right? Your opinion most definitely needs to be heard. And quite frankly, I'd like to learn from you. And we sat down and we had a very interesting interview. It was, you know, very educational for me as, as and that's kind of what I'm trying to do is trying to research and learn, you know, these different perspectives. But this is what's so powerful with, I think, media and things like that. But we also have to, I want people to realize as well is that we are, you know, as YouTubers, we're constantly battling censorship. Um, the, the, I don't know if you heard this story. Um, did you did you hear that there was a NASCAR race driver, Alex? He was, he has been suspended by NASCAR because he liked a George Floyd meme on Twitter, Right. So yeah. he's, you know, so, so again, like there is the, you know, so we're at a point now where, you know, this cancel culture in the United States is so prevalent. I mean, it is such a big thing right now where, you know, people, you know, we talk about, we have freedom of speech here in the United States. Well, it's very interesting because there's a lot of things that you cannot say or else you will be canceled, you know, and, and I, I do feel that this is an invasion of freedom of speech because, you know, for example, I mean, even if you want to go on and, you know, I mean, the, the big thing here in the United States is, you know, gender, you know, gender laws and things like that. If you if you if you, you know, I mean, we've seen people, um, you know, there's an NCAA swimmer who said that there are two sexes, you know, there's male and female. And she got her Twitter, you know, Twitter account of 200,000 people, you know, deplatformed, you know, she was deplatformed for for vocally, you know, saying that. And, you know, it's like, well, hey, look, I'm an NCAA swimmer. You know, this is how, what I feel. And no, you can't say that. 
you know, you, you're now deplatformed from Twitter, you know, you now have been canceled. And, you know, so she had to start a new account, you know, when Elon Musk, you know, happened. And it's just, it's just very interesting where, you know, we want to, on one side, we want to blame China for, uh, okay, China censors content. Absolutely, they do. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not going to deny that China censors content. There's a lot of censorship that happens in China for sure. But it's also very interesting to see how, okay, you're a, you're a, a celebrity and you've said this thing, well, you're now canceled. You know, you, you're now canceled. You get your risk deplatformed. Uh, you and I, we've had videos scrubbed off of YouTube. Um, yeah. I remember, you know, I remember putting out a YouTube very early about the Hong Kong protest in May 2020. I put out a YouTube video and it was removed directly from YouTube mm -hmm. saying this does not meet our community guidelines. And what's Correct. interesting with that is that you never get a reason from YouTube. Mm -hmm. It's always it doesn't meet our community guidelines. And you'll, you'll, yeah. you'll, you can send an email in, you know, can you can you specifically tell me what part of the video no, we can't. It just hasn't met our community guidelines. So you don't actually know. There's no feedback. It's just, you know what? We don't, it doesn't match what we want on the platform. And, you know, I'm sorry, I'm going off a tangent here, but the big thing that's the big story that's happening right now in Canada, you know, once again, our country, Canada, back in, you know, Justin Trudeau, you know, Justin Trudeau has passed now this, you know, his, is moving on with this bill, Bill C 11, which yep. is, you know, which is designed to basically monitor all free and independent voices that are on social media. So if you are in Canada and you are a YouTuber or you're on Instagram or Twitter, whatever content that you are putting out, it is now subjected to the same laws and regulations that TV and news papers are regulated to in Canada. So for example, you know, if you have anything that says, you know, for example, the big topic in Canada was, for example, vaccines, COVID vaccines. If you have yeah. anything that is that goes against what the government's position is, you, you, you're out. Okay. They will absolutely, they will absolutely censor you. You will either get that post that will be deleted from the Canadian government, or you will risk being deplatformed because you cannot simply say that. And, and that is a very, and so this was a very dangerous thing that, so this was, first of all, went right to YouTube headquarters in California. They emailed every Canadian content creator and they said, look, this is a massive deal because this is a huge violation of freedom of speech. And, you know, this is a very risky thing for Canada to do. You know, even YouTube, they paid for YouTubers, you know, Canadian YouTubers, you know, they flew them to Ottawa. They flew them to the parliament and they said, look, you know, we will fly you there to protest and to basically get in front of the government. And, and we want you to just make videos about it. We will help you promote those videos. We, this is a dangerous thing that the Canadian government and Justin Trudeau is going under. And, you know, they did it, they protested, they did their things and they had their voice. And of course, you know, that's the other interesting thing is it's like, yes, they have the freedom to protest and go speak, but at the end of the day, it doesn't do anything. You know, at the end of the day, it's like, thanks for coming. Really appreciate you spending time here in parliament and saying that you can go home now because we're going to go pass the bill. And that's exactly what Justin Trudeau is moving forward with that because, you know, I mean, he's, I mean, he honestly, he's, he's the worst leader that Canada's had, I, I would say, I mean, arguably in, in history, he's absolutely just been a, a horrific leader for for Canada and it's just horrible the way that he is leading that country and I think we see that see that last week I mean his wife finally said I can't take it anymore I'm out <laughs> um I'm gonna bring on uh, Cyrus I have uh, Angelo backstage here uh he uh resides uh well I'll let him explain let's bring him onto the show for a bit here and then we're gonna get back to your slides and I have a lot to say about uh your media where you said you know the media started to go downhill well that was around 95, 96, we started to see the arrows go down. Well, that was the birth of the internet where, you know, I got my first sitting in at the computer and uh, I never left a computer for three days and was watching and reading and saying, wait a moment, that wasn't what I learned in school books. Wait a minute, that wasn't part of my curriculum. Um, and that changed the world as we know it. Let's bring on Angelo here. Uh, we, I think he's out in the sunshine there. I'm not sure where. Hey, Angelo, how are you? This is Cyrus and Alex. How's it going? Hi, my friends. Uh, you know, I, I'm I'm so glad to to be with you guys. Uh, I heard uh, Cyrus was coming, so I, I was like, let me jump in like 10, 15 minutes because uh, I nice. love what Cyrus is doing. Do you guys doing. know each other? Do you guys know each other? We do. We do. We've been we've done, we've done <laughs> yes. we've done on live streams together. Angelo, I haven't seen you in a while, brother. But it's good to see yeah. you. Yeah, and look, yeah, I got I got to show you. I mean, I'm I'm here like in Switzerland. This is Switzerland. So beautiful Switzerland uh, by the lakeside. It's just amazing. And uh, I, I like to come to Switzerland once a year just to, to see the contrast. Uh, you know, our society, Western society is changing. And also, uh, and living in China, that's, a, that's the blessing of my life. Three, close to three decades in China. 
And I think I think we have a responsibility. We don't need to say that China is nice and so on. We just need to to tell people how is China, what is happening in China, and and it's hard to criticize China because everything is positive every single day. You see positive changes, and guess what? You know, China doesn't need we. It's not up to us to like China. It's up to Chinese. Okay, we most of the foreigners that live in China they love it. But then you talk to Chinese and they are so happy. You know why? Because they've seen the changes of the last 40 years. You know, right. they, they saw how China was. They see China, how China is now and the direction where China is going. And what puts me to shame, because, well, you know, I, I think it's important also to say, to tell people that we love our countries. And it's not because we like China that we speak, you know, nicely about China. It's also, we, we need to step out and speak speak up about the reality because the direction when you look at western media the, the this whole narrative of our about china being bad and so on uh, it, it's it, it is a responsibility responsibility from our side just to tell the truth what is happening it's very positive and, and i think we should uh, for me it was actually not only i was learning a lot about china but by being in china it was an opportunity to learn about my own society i just give you an example just this concept of democracy. Uh, with so many years in China, I realized that the way they see democracy is not the mob rule, the 51% that is going to rule over the 49%. It's not, because this is a dividing thing. It's a mob rule is going to be one majority at the expense of the minority. The way it works in China is very different. They take into account, okay, we have the majority, there's a minority, how can we reach a conclusion, a compromise, where everybody's going to be happy. Because in a Western society, what we have is that you, you see the Republicans, Democrats, which, by the way, ultimately are all the same. But every time you have this antagonizing two sides, and every time there's one side which is extremely unhappy. In China, it's very different. It's very mature. It's not a divided and controlled system. It's really about how we can find common prosperity, people being satisfied. And, and, and you know, the, what they, they're looking at is they're looking at how we can have stability, how we can have prosperity, and how we can have tangible results. You know, in China, they, the politicians cannot lie to the people. If they were to lie, you know, you have five years, 10 years plan, 20 years plan, they can't lie, they need to deliver. If they don't deliver, and that would be a chaos. Uh, there's not a single politician in China that can, can say, well, you know what, I'm going to build this road and five years later, nothing, nothing happened. They need to deliver. Well, in the West, it's a vicious circle of elect and regret. They don't deliver, it doesn't matter. I'm going to tell you what you want to hear. If I deliver or not, it doesn't matter. And ultimately, do they listen to the voters? No, they will listen to whoever funds them. So I think what we need to do is, is Bridge, that's what we're trying to do here is bridging. You know, there's a misconception, misunderstanding from both, both sides. But I would say, honestly, you know what? Chinese, they know about the Western world. They know how we function. The problem is on the West. They even know our own society. And we, we don't even know anything about China. The only thing that they know about China, what do they know? They know Xi Jinping. That's all they know, you know. If you talk to average Joe, a taxi driver in, in Hong Kong, not in Hong Kong, Hong, any big cities, they will know everything about Western politics. And this is the attitude of Chinese, you know. They say, zi 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 bi. know yourself and know your enemy, you know. And the problem is we have in the West is this arrogance. We have self-centered and we think we are the best and this is going to be our loss. You know, we have such an opportunity to work together. There's so much we can learn from China and vice versa and have this common prosperity. And the problem, sadly, you mentioned just before, Ukraine, you know, they were like for the last 18 months, oh, we love Ukraine and so on. And we just realized that, you know what? They're using, they're using Ukraine and they keep on doing the same thing. Proxy wars. What is the next one? We see in Africa, they're going to, to try to use Nigerians to invade Nigeria, you know, Africans between, uh, against Africans. It's all the divide and conquer. But they do it not only on geopolitics, they do it at home too. 
it's a system where you have the Republicans and Democrats. You need to have them fight. So it gives you an illusion of free choice and democracy. But it's not because ultimately it's a fight, not the left and the right. It's the upper class and the 99 percent. Ups, the one up and the one down. And, and they need to confuse you and divide co constantly because otherwise they will lose the power. What they're afraid of is that people, the 99%, they realize that they're being used all over, all the time. And, and, and China is different. You know, China is so complex. It's a huge population. They can't afford to have the, this divided and conquered. This is why the, you would never see a, a Western style democracy in China. It will not work because in many ways it doesn't fit China, its culture, uh, and, and it's problematic. It's a very complex society. And ultimately, you know what? Where does it work? Look around, you know, there, Howard University, they, they, were, they did surveys on, 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 uh, on, on, on China and, and in the US. 30% of the people in the US, they're happy with their system. So yeah, that means 70% are not happy. Well, guess what? China, 95%, and that's Howard University. Unless, unless people say that Howard University that has a bias for the Chinese, uh, Chinese Communist Party, but it's not, you know, that's the reality. So I think, I think we need to, you know, we need all society just to look at all society better, you know, but it's not by, by looking at China and saying, well, China is us, how can I destroy China so I will look better? Why don't we look, do introspection, look at our own society and see how can we do better? Because look at the last 30 years. What have we done for people? What have we done? Nothing, nothing. You know, my parents, they, live, they, they used to live much better 30, 40 years ago than the new generation now. My parents, you know, only my father was working, my mother was staying at home and they could raise two kids and they have a house. Now, right. you know, people are working three jobs. You know, they're starving. You know, they are in a, you know, it's, it's this whole society of, you know, they, 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 they just make sure you are in a survival mode and they keep people divided and they distract people over identity issues, over BS. Why? When ultimately what people are asking is food on the table, education, healthcare. Sorry, it was a, a small marathon, guys. I, no, it's guys, guys, I, I, have, I have to leave. I'm just outside. Thank you so much, uh, Angela. <laughs> I, I love pleasure. what you guys are doing. Keep on doing what you are doing. We are, you know, we need to look at the big picture. And again, what we, we are doing this, not only for world peace, but also, you know, for our own country. You know, I think it's important that we, we tell people that if we do this, it's also because we love our country and we want it to prosper within this, this, this multipolar world. Absolutely. Well, I Angela, appreciate that. Angela, appreciate great. The yeah, great insight, Angelo. So good to see you. And you know, yeah. you've been um, you've been a great voice on on, on this you, issue for, for many years. And you know, really, really, really appreciate it. Thank you, my friends. I see you guys Take soon. Care, Angelo. Yeah, bye bye. Take care. We'll see you. So, that was great to see, Angelo. Um, uh, so, Cyrus, I, I want to uh, go back to some of your points that you made here earlier in the show. Yeah. We were talking about media, and we have the the slide up here. And I'm going to bring it back up for a moment here, and I just want to get uh, to chat about it. So. If you see there in around 93, 94, 95, then there's a graph, steady graph all the way down. It's going to continue that way. What's happened is, is people now have tools that they can go out and they can get uh, the other side or research the other side. And these are why people end up on our channels. Thank you very much to all the subscribers. I mean, Absolutely. it means a lot to us. It means a lot when you you know, come in and that's okay. And if you're in the comment section, you disagree or you don't agree with everybody. If you think somebody has a bias, listen, I was born in Canada. Uh, the internet uh, was a, you know, a massive life changer for me. A lot of, if we have some of the young audience in here, maybe you were born with the internet, but imagine having the internet at 26 for your first time, opening up a computer and voila, being able to ask a computer Questions that maybe you waited weeks or months or made it waited, uh, you know, a couple of months to get a book ordered in the library so that you could read and research on that. 
this information uh, just came piling. But, you know, Cyrus, uh, you made a comment about, you know, this conflict in uh, Ukraine. And I, we're not going to spend too much time on that in the show today. But they do not want this war over. It cannot end for the military industrial complex. It's it's not going to end. And this term where we hear people say, well, we will beat Russia. I've asked this many a times to people. What does that mean you're going to beat Russia or you want to beat Russia? Well, um, if we put more jets in, if we put more tanks in, if we put more cluster bombs in, if we put more ammunition in, if we put NATO troops in, you cannot win. It's not about uh, you know, a game of chess where everybody's there and it's checkmate. No, it doesn't happen. You continually push uh, this country, Russia, into a corner. And let's say you do get the advantage, Cyrus. Let's say NATO yeah. and the, the NATO-led uh, support support for the Ukraine does get the upper hand on this. And, and you hear guys like Lindsey Graham, you know, we'll fight to the last soldier. We want to wipe Russia off the, off the planet. This country, hello, everyone. This country has the capability to blow up the goal, the, the entire globe about a, a hundred times. Yeah. And uh, if backed into a corner, you know, we might say, Oh no, it'll never get to that. No, it won't get to that. Didn't we just have an anniversary a couple of days ago of a country that uh, did it twice and obliterated a, a population in, in Japan, Nagasaki and Hiroshima? Right. So it, this is what these guys that are making these decisions are messing with. <laughs> I can only tell you from having my conversations with Patrick Lancaster, it's terrible on the other side too. Yeah. These are there's soldiers dying on both sides. It's horrible. But you are wiping out an absolute generation of young men that are going to be needed to rebuild that country. And they're dying in the thousands of every day. And nobody, Cyrus, I mean, you're the ambassador of peace. Where the hell is everybody? Where is France? Where's Germany? Where's Italy? Where where's one single country? in the European Union or the collective West that says enough is enough. We've seen enough people die. So many people are dying. Uh, it's us against them. It's, you know, oh, no, let's ramp up NATO in uh, Sweden. Oh, no, let's ramp up NATO in uh, Finland too. You know, and the Baltic states, of course, they feel vulnerable. 25% of their population is is ethnic Russians. Yeah, You've got Kaliningrad, you got all these other uh, breakaways. I sent you a tweet yesterday about what Latvians doing to ethnic Russia. It's an absolute mess. This could be avoided. It they, Somebody should sit down at the table. I mean, I appreciate the Saudis having this, but there's one major uh, party that's not at the negotiation table or was invited, and that's Russia. So yeah. that that is that's going nowhere. True. Stalemate, yeah. as uh, Andrew uh, Alex uh, Christopher says. Yeah. Uh, we've got some good slides here, Cyrus. Uh, tell us what we're. You want me to put up the next one? Yeah, let's yeah. let's. Um, well, I think let's get back to the to the China issue. I want you to bring up that uh, that Nikki Haley video. Oh, I think yeah. this will okay. be a good. Uh, this will be a good one. So. I'm going to play this twice if you guys don't mind. Okay, so we it's it's a short video of Nikki Haley, but let's uh, let me see where it is. Uh, do, 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 do. Carry on, Cyrus. I'm going to come back. I'm going to find this file for you. Okay, uh, give me a moment. All right, I'll just uh, hand it over to you for a second. Okay. Yeah, I just got to upload it. So oh, I'll be about two minutes. Okay, sure, sure, no problem. Um, well, I think Alex, let's lead into that. Let's, let's bring up that slide that you just had in there. I think that was a really good one because I want people to understand. I sent out a tweet. So I put up my tweet that I sent out, um, you know, a couple weeks ago. I sent out this tweet that that uh, you know really performed really well, and I want people to just understand exactly, um, you know, what's what's going on with you know, kind of our message and how things have shifted specifically with China. Let's really keep it to China. And I want people to kind of go back in time because, you know, up until 2017, you know, really, you know, the Americans did not believe that China was the greatest threat to, um, you know, the future of, uh, you know, ba basically to the future of the United States. And so I think what we're really seeing is, is that, you know, I think we got to go back in time and see what has happened, right? We've had Donald Trump launch a trade war against China in 2018. You know, Donald Trump really started doubling down on the fact that, you know, I mean, started using China as a scapegoat for the United States problems. And unfortunately, what I'm seeing in the United States is that has continued 
to, you know, basically compound. And, you know, we've seen this thing where all of a sudden Donald Trump is saying, look, you know, you know, China is taking advantage of the United States as far as, you know, its trade, you know, our trade deficit, you know, you know, they're getting a better deal than what we're getting. You know, it should be America first. We should be getting a better deal. You know, we need to be ending this trade war. The interesting thing about that is that it actually hurt most Americans because what you're doing is, is you're putting tariffs on the Chinese goods that American citizens actually need. And I think this is an interesting stat that many people don't realize is that, you know, we constantly hear this thing that China's the biggest threat. We constantly hear that we need to decouple from China. But as of last year, you know, Chinese imports into the United States actually increased by 6% actually increased by 6%. I think that's a phenomenal stat that people need to understand. And last year, $564 billion worth of products, you know, left China and entered into the United States. So the issue is, is that, you know, we have so many things that are, you know, that are manufactured in China that are really driving the United States economy. And, you know, one of the things that I do is I talk with a lot of, uh, you know, factory owners, I talk with businessmen here in the United States, and it's just interesting. I mean, even if we look at the studio, things from my headphones to the speaker, to my laptop, to the cameras, to, you know, the mouse that I use, to everything, I mean, all of this is really manufactured in China. And there's a really important reason why that is done. And it's also, you know, for many of you, for example, if you've watched my, one of my latest videos is I launched a video talking about, you know, I visited a Chinese factory. You know, I actually went, you know, flew to China, went to Wuxi, went to a smaller town called Jiangyin, uh, which is really the textile, um, you know, factory of China. There's a tremendous amount of textile factories in that local area. Uh, some of the most successful textile companies in all of China are located in Jiangyin. And I went and visited these factories. And it's just what's remarkable about China that people don't really understand. And this is what I really thought was just so fascinating is that, for example, if you're manufacturing clothing in China, well, in Jiangyin, they have all of your manufacturers are basically in that same area. So for example, if you need buttons, there's a button factory down the road. If you need, um, you know, the, the cotton is down the road, the, the zippers, everything is kind of manufactured in this one area. And that is what, you know, so many of the raw materials that are used for manufacturing clothing, they're all located within China. So it's really interesting when we hear like, we need to move these factories out of China. Let's move them to Vietnam. Let's move them to, you know, Mexico. Let's move them to wherever we want to move them to. The fascinating thing is uh oh there we go there's the video right there so um this is the video that i put out and so this is what me you know walking through the factory there this is a factory called Kalito. Uh, it was a great opportunity for me to collaborate with this factory there i, I interviewed a norwegian national who is the owner he's a co-owner of this factory and i think what was really interesting about this alex was just being able to see the Chinese advantage of being able to have all of these raw materials, you know, basically within a 20, 30 minute drive of their factory. Um, you know, if they need embroidery, there's an embroidery factory down the road. If they need to dye the fabrics, okay, you know, because obviously all these fabrics have different colors, you know, that's just right down the road as well. And I think that's what China, they just do that so well is manufacturing the, the entire logistical um, supply chain is just phenomenal. I mean, it really is truly incredible. Um, you guys can go to my channel and watch that video later on. But basically, there's Tommy there on the left, who is the Norwegian businessman that's been there for over 10 years. Uh, I'm sorry, been, been traveling to uh, Wuxi for over 16 years doing business there and, you know, being this bridge between the West and East, which is just phenomenal. But Alex, um, do you have that clip up of, yep. of uh, Nikki Haley here? I want to uh, show that. And just a quick segment here. I want to thank uh, John Lee and uh, Tom Liu uh, for sending those super chats in. Guys, thank you so much for, um, you know, uh, thank you so much for your support uh, to the channel. Really appreciate it as always. So, um, Alex, let's go ahead and tee this video up. This is quite an interesting one. Sure. And we'll play it a couple of times. It's a 30-second clip, or if you can handle it more than... <laughs> More than once. That's yeah, yeah. Let's, let's, play it, let's play it twice. I think people need to hear this. Okay. All right. Here we go. Uh, let me just get the and uh, thanks again for all the super chats. We we do uh, appreciate that and your support uh, does help these channels as well. And uh, let's uh, bring up this clip. Here we go, Cyrus. All right. Here we are. Nikki Haley fought America's enemies at the UN and won. China's dictators want to cover the world in communist tyranny. Nikki Haley. Tough as nails, smart as a whip, unafraid to speak the truth. Communist China won't just lose. 
like the Soviet Union before it, communist China will end up on the ash heap of history. Nikki Haley, a strong leader for a strong America. SFA Fund Inc. is responsible for the content of this advertising. Hey, Alex, let me let me break that down first, uh, you know, and then we'll play it again. I mean, there's a couple things that I want people to understand. You know, this is the interesting thing. You know, the first I think there's two major problems with this club. Number one, you know, Nikki Haley is, is you know, first of all, this is what is happening in American politics, um, w- which is very different from anywhere else in the world. Uh, you know, having lived in Canada for five years, what's interesting with Canada is that the laws in Canada, it, it's very specific when you're running your political ads that, you know, you have certain guidelines, right? Like in Canada, you don't have um, candidates attacking other candidates. You have to be very clear with your language. It's a much more civil environment. And the interesting thing with Canada's government is that you call an election. There's not a set date, right? If you're the current prime minister, you can basically call an election. When you, let's say, hey, we're going to have an election now. Six weeks from now, you vote. So you have a very short window to actually campaign. It's a very different system. In the United States, as we know, we have an election every four years. So what's happening now is, you know, for the next 18 months, Americans are going to be bombarded with political ads. And basically, it's just everybody attacking everybody. There's no there's no rules. You can say whatever you want. You can basically, you know, slander. You can attack. You can basically, you know, have these very crazy campaigns against your competitors. And this is what's happening in the United States is that people are going to try to tap into your emotions. And this is what people are saying. It's like Nikki Haley, very strong Republican, saying China wants to spread communism around the world. They want to spread their method all over the world to many countries around the world. That's the first thing that I've that I, I've been saying this for years. I don't see any evidence of this at all. Zero. I don't see China ever wanting to export its model. And quite frankly, you know, I would be the first one to say, look, I don't want Chinese communism inside the United States, mainly because it's it's a different model. It just, you know, every country in the world has to figure out a model that works for them. I think with China. And what you've seen when you talk to intelligent business people that actually understand this, a great example would be Charlie uh, Munger, who is the right-hand man of Warren Buffett. He was very vocal. He said, there is no way that China could have risen from one of the poorest countries in the world in 1949 to the second most powerful economy, soon to be most powerful economy in the world, you know, under a democracy. It just wouldn't have happened because there's too much fighting, there's too much bickering, and the, the you, you know the reality is is that when you're that poor and you need to transform that quickly, you need a one party state to you know essentially make you know clear decisions. Look, this is our five year plan. This is what we're going to do. We're going to go execute that plan. Now that's not to say that China didn't make mistakes along the way. Obviously, we look at the Great Leap Forward. We look at the Cultural Revolution. These are very dark times for China that you know were filled with massive mistakes that under Mao Zedong. So yes, there, China made mistakes along the way. We've also done similar mistakes where you know we've been involved in you know I mean you look at the Vietnam War that was an absolute disaster for the United States. I mean my father was stationed in Vietnam for two years and it was quite interesting you know listening to him because he was a young man. Oh, there we go. Lost my. No, oh, oh, hold on. I'm gonna have to. Uh, no problem, Cyrus. <laughs> I don't know why my battery dies out. Never used to do that, but we're gonna switch. Look at no this. Worries. Take your time. Take your we're time. We're gonna switch over here. All right, here we're we back go. In, we're back yeah. in the game here. All right. So the, you know the interesting thing, Alex, is that you know my father he fought in the Vietnam War, and you know I, I always was in, I'm always interested to hear his experiences with that because he said, you know, Cyrus, what we would do is you know we would basically be I was in Da Nang. I, we, we'd be flown in there with my troops. And what we would do is we would basically, we would have a grid. Let's imagine it's this screen. And so what we would do is we would start here in the corner and we would just march all the way over, go down, march all the way over, go down. And we would basically complete this grid like this in the jungle. We would do that for two weeks. We'd then be flown back to base and we would rest for a week. And then we'd go back and we'd go to another plot. And we would basically, and I'm like, well, what were you doing? What are you marching there? And he's like, I don't really know. We were just marching, looking for people. You know, if we saw somebody, we'd try to shoot them. And I'm like, what was the what was the purpose? You know, like, and he's <laughs> like, I'm not really sure. Like, that's just what we did for like a year of my life. We just were, I would just walk through the Vietnam, you know, the jungles of Vietnam. None of us really knew. I mean, he's a he's a farm boy from Iowa. You know, I mean, he, you know, left very young age, you know, to get out in the military. And I think what was uh, you know, really interesting is is you know, we look back. I mean, I know um you know, many Americans were against that war. I mean, there was no strategic purpose there. Again, you go back to the America's biggest fault. Our thing was the domino theory, right? We wanted to go in and say, look, we need to change Vietnam from a from a communist country into a democracy or else 
communism is going to spread to every country in in Asia, and it's going to be a disaster. You know that theory did not work out. Obviously, Viet, you know communism didn't spread. Um, you know Vietnam, by the way. You know America lost that war. Um, and and the thing is, is that it's it's uh, it's very interesting because you talk to older. I remember talking to. Um, uh, I remember going. I was working in Hong Kong about 2017. I had a guy that flew out um, for. He was for an American company. And he and he's just like, yeah, I was in the Marine Corps. He's like, I just flew into Saigon, and uh, he, he goes, uh, and and I go, Saigon? You mean Ho Chi Minh City? He's just like, mm-hmm. we don't call it Ho Chi Minh City. You know, America, we won that war. It's called Saigon. I'm like, no, no, I'm pretty sure it's called Ho Chi Minh City. Actually, I, I actually went there, the same. and and I'm just like, you know, sorry to burst your bubble. We didn't win the war, you know. But it was just, it was, and it, he was so it kind of had this spite and anger in his voice of frustration because he was there. He's like, look, I, I served in Vietnam. I'm like, Hey, so did my father. But I'm like, at the end of the day, Vietnam's a communist country. Like I'm, I'm not, I'm not, that's not propaganda. Like that's just a fact. And, and, you know, you can call it Saigon, but that's not what it's called. It's called Ho Chi Minh city because that's, that's who, you know, whoever wins the war gets to write the history books. Guess what? It's called Ho Chi Minh. And it's, it's, it, you know, that's just what it is. And so I think the interesting thing here, Alex is, you know, we are seeing these same mistakes. We got involved in the Vietnam war because of a domino theory. The fact that communism is going to spread. We didn't see it happen. It didn't happen. Vietnam has remained communism. Now, when Nikki comes out and says that China wants to spread its philosophy, I don't believe that at all. I don't see any evidence of that at all. What I see China wanting to do is run their own system. Now, is communism the best system for China? Honestly, as foreigners, that's really not for us to debate. You know, I'm not a Chinese national. I'm, I don't serve in China's government. That is a decision that Chinese people and the Chinese government officials have to sort out. Um, but what I do think, what a lot of people, you know, we we kind of equate in America, you know, I see this big thing of, Oh, you know, like, well, you know, in China, you don't get to vote for your president. Yeah, that's that's true. You don't. But, you know, the problem is, is that when I was in China uh, last month, I, I, you know, it was really interesting, Alex. I had a lot of people I was talking to on the street. They they asked me, it's like, how is Biden the president? Like, he's so he like, how is that guy your president? Like, did you guys vote for him? Like, he's so old and he really, you know, he really, you know, is struggling with his, you know, his cognitive functioning right now. He's just not as clear, you know, and I'm just like, yeah, I mean, you know, Biden, I mean, it's just, you know, unfortunately, like Angelo said, we have this this very big system of elect and regret. And what's interesting is, is we're moving towards 2024. And I mean, right now, I mean, the front runners are Biden, Trump again. I mean, it's looking like another Biden, Trump. And it's like, wow. Are we really going to have a repeat of 2020 and basically, you know, two guys, one guy that's going to be 82, 83 years old, another guy, Trump, it's not young either. I mean, he's, he's approaching 80 as well. Is that really the two best options in the United States? So it's interesting because, yes, I do get a choice as an American citizen. I get to vote, you know, but the problem is I only I've only got two choices. You know, America only has two parties. We only have one additional party to China, uh, which is which is quite interesting, you know, because we. You know, so that, I think that's the first problem with that Nikki Haley clip, Alex, is that they, you know, Americans are using this as propaganda. Like I said, we're very good at propaganda in the United States. We're that is 100% propaganda. China does not want to export its system around the world. I've never seen a, I've never seen China saying, "Hey, you know what, America, you should change to communism," or or even Africa. You know, that's the interesting thing when you look at the, you know, the Belt and Road, which I've broken down in many videos. You know, it doesn't matter if you're a democracy. If you're an autocracy, if you're a dictator, it doesn't matter what you are. China goes in there to do business. Hey, we're going to build you a bridge. You know, you know, can you start ex- exporting this mineral to us? I don't really care what government it is. Like, we'll build you the bridge, and then you give us this asset. Like, that's this is a transaction. What you, how you guys serve you, how you guys take care of your government and how your people. That's none of our business. We could care less, right? Just don't come into our space and say. You know, we need to do that. And I think there's an important thing that people need to realize right now. I want people to really understand this. I'm going to go out. I'm going to say this very clearly. There is not a country in the world. Forget China. There's not another country in the world that is looking at the United States right now as a model democracy. Okay. That's, you know, our democracy is so dysfunctional. It is declining rapidly every day. And, you know, there is so many internal issues that we have. Go talk to people in France and Germany on how they view American democracy. I lived in Canada for five years. I can't tell you how, I mean, this is what it was amazing, Alex, right? I would tell people, oh, Cyrus, you know, meeting somebody new in Canada. And it's like, oh, I'm, I'm actually, you know, I'm from the U.S. And they're like, oh, 
I can see why you left, you know, welcome to Canada, you know, like, oh, really, you're from the US, you know, you have this almost, this almost kind of pity, and this thing of, of just like, um, man, like, what happened to your country? Like, you know, you know, Canadians, generally speaking, Canadians love America, right? They follow American politics. Uh, American politics is much more entertaining than Canadian politics. Like I said, Canadian politics is pretty dry and boring. But you know, it's almost like we've become this internet meme, we've become this you know, we've become the best reality TV show is turn on Fox News and CNN and just see the the just absolute drama and nonsense that's happening in the US. Most Canadians are following it. But obviously, sharing a 4000 mile long border between the US and Canada, most Canadians are like, man, we really we want a strong America. But you know, what's happening in America right now, it's just it looks it's a crap show right now. You guys are just what happened? You know, like, and, and I mean, we've had this steady decline. And I mean, you know, I mean, for five years, I would always ask Canadians, like, what do you think of America? What do you think of this? And obviously, Canadians love America, you know, but I think most Canadians have really seen the image of America decline tremendously on the international stage. And it's just not what it was before. And so that's that's where I think, you know, where Nikki Haley is really missing the mark there. Um, sorry, Alex, I've been going on for a while. You want to add anything to that? Oh, well, let's call Nikki Haley, which she's, she's a neocon. Yeah, uh, she's 100%. been behind a lot of failed, uh, we'll call it conflicts around the world. Uh, she's led militaries in there where they shouldn't have gone in. Uh, she was in the, you know, cahoots of trying to get uh, the Syrian leader Assad out. Uh, I mean, this is a country, uh, and don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm Canadian, you're American. Let's have this chat. Um, we used to love uh, the United States. I think when I was you know, 16, 18, it, that was that beacon of, wow, this is what it's going to be. But absolute today, no thanks. Not interested. Um, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm exactly where I want to be right now. Um, and, you know, when you get people that say, oh, wait a minute, you know, China, communist China, it's, you know, uh, a dictator. Yet, they'll be the first person that would arrive at the airport in Vietnam. OK, and then they will be the next people that say, after we're done Vietnam, let's head to Laos. Well, Laos, <laughs> the Democratic People's uh, Republic of Laos, which was bombed into submission by the Americans. And oh, yeah. trust me, this is this. Uh, and I'm focusing this on, uh, you know, the war machine here, because this war machines really got this globe into a big, big mess right now. This has been going on. 36 conflicts since World War II. The numbers are staggering. Right at the start of this program, I cranked it off with BlackRock. Yeah. There's massive money here, everyone. Massive money. I mean, look at Lithuania's NATO show just recently. I mean, how many salesmen do you think showed up selling arms there? You know, it was like a, a buffet of uh, what do you want? We got it for sale. Um Ukraine is a dumping post for all old NATO equipment. And we have this vision. And uh, don't get me wrong. I like Americans. Okay. The issue that I have now is when they start to fund uh, destructions of countries like the Ukraine. You think they're doing Ukraine a favor by pumping in more arm peace? Their, their, their road to peace is more arms, yeah. <laughs> more bombing. That's that's their road to peace. This is supposed to be a country when at least I grew up would be a country of maybe diplomacy. I have not seen a, you know, a, a politician or someone come over to Southeast Asia and say, you know what? We will both win together. Well, maybe the last administration, at least. They were strong arming some stuff, but at least they came over and they negotiated deals and they went away with handshakes. Uh, we saw that, uh, uh, you know, that walk across the South and North Korean border. Um, we see these things. And where did that go? I mean, it's in Hollywood. They got in Hollywood. But in today's day and age, all it is is, as you say, divide and conquer. They're going to use that playbook. They're going to go into these countries. They're going to destabilize it. Ukraine is not going to figure itself out this year. It's not going to figure itself out next year. That could go on for another five years until that country is gone. And yeah. that could be the end of it as we, we see it. Yet, this decision is being made in Washington. 
And that's what really irks me. I mean, these wars are catastrophic uh, for you, no matter who you are. And it won't take much, Cyrus. It won't take much to to expand on this. Uh, you know, one strayed missile into Belarus, and it's game on. It's yeah, game on. It, it, we we don't we don't understand. You know, our politicians don't understand that we're marching more and more closer to a, a huge hot war. And I mean, that's that would be absolutely very hot. Very, very hot war. Alex, play that Nikki Haley mm. clip one more time because I want to. I want to now. I, I talked about the first part of it. Let's talk about the second part, which I think is just completely irresponsible. Let's play, play that clip one more time. Yep. Nikki Haley fought America's enemies at the UN and won. China's dictators want to cover the world in communist tyranny. Nikki Haley, tough as nails, smart as a whip, unafraid to speak the truth. Communist China won't just lose. Like the Soviet Union before it, Communist China will end up on the ash heap of history. Nikki Haley, a strong leader for a strong America. SFA Funding is responsible for the content of this advertising. Cyrus, I mean, that is, that, your uh, comment. Yeah. How can somebody be so out of touch with reality? I mean, How? well, it's just, I mean, again, it's just, it's the, it's the propaganda. Smart as a whip. What is it? You know, tough as nails and smart as a whip. And and that's the problem, though, is most Americans, you know, they they just we 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 live in a bubble here in the United States. Most Americans have no concept of anything happening outside of the, this country, right? So the issue is, is that you can go on the you can make an ad like this and say, hey, China, you know, China's dictators are trying to take over the world and spread their philosophy. Oh, really? I didn't know that. And and the issue is, is you know, now now the second thing is is that. You look at the second part of that, right? China's government, you know, the Communist Party is going to end on the ash heap of history here, just like the Soviet Union. So essentially what Nikki Haley is calling for, is she's calling for yeah. regime change in China. Absolutely. And, Sorry. Right. Absolutely. right. She's calling for regime change. She's saying we're going to take down the communist government of China. And the issue with this, Alex, is, is that from my opinion, this is the most important thing is that you've missed the assignment, right? You're running for the president of the United States. Your job is to serve the American people. You need to focus on the issues that are that that are that are pro that are a huge issue inside of our country right now. I mean, you look at the public school system in the United States. It's an absolute disaster. I live in, I live in Nevada, which has, which is ranked 50th out of 50 in this, as, as far as public school, you cannot send your kids to a public school here. Um, specifically the city of Las Vegas It's an absolute disaster. Um, I mean, we, we, you know, we, we have, um, we have, I mean, California kids are, you know, they don't have school lunches. You know, I remember reading a story in, about Florida where, you know, they can't pay the electricity bills and they're contemplating going to a four day school week, you know, giving kids off on Friday just so they can save electricity. Like this is what's happening inside the United States, the supposedly greatest nation in the world. And, and this is the problem when you, you know, when you're so focused on external problems and, you know, the, the biggest issue is, and again, I, I want people to be clear. I'm not anti-democracy. I'm not anti-democratic. You know, again, I'm, I think, you know, America's government is fine. I mean, that's what we've chosen. That's what we've used for hundreds of years. And I think, you know, the, the issue is, is that, you know, what we need to do is we need to focus on you know, the issues that are really plaguing America. But the problem is, is a person like Nikki Haley, they're blaming everything on China. It's the easy scapegoat. Yeah. And they're tapping into that emotion to try to get your vote. And that is the dangerous thing with this American politics is that we lack this in-depth thinking. Like you said, how can she be so out of touch with reality? First of all, You've missed the assignment. You know, change, regime change in China is not your objective as an American president. And, and the it is going to happen. And, 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 and well, the interesting thing, and this is what I want people to really take away. I, what I find a very interesting paradox is that in the United States, we are so scared of communism, right? I mean, the word communism or socialism is very, very scary for most Americans. I mean, th this is what we're taught from day one in America mm -hmm. is that communism equals evil. Therefore, if China's communist, then China is evil. That's kind of the, the way of thinking here. And the funny thing is, is that if communism is so bad, why are we worried about China then? Like in, in my mindset, I'm just like, well, if, if communism is doomed to fail, why don't we let China just get on with it, right? Why don't we just let China fail, right? Like if, if our internal belief is that democracy is such a better form of government and communism is the worst form of government, well, why don't we just let them get on with it? Right. If, 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 if it's destined to fail, let China fail then. But we don't see that. You know, that would be a position of strength and, and something that says, hey, look, I, I know that I'm a democracy. I know that I'm the United States. I'm not worried about anything else because 
we, we believe we have the best form of government. But the problem is, is you know that we have a declining democracy. You know that people are losing faith in media. People are losing faith in democracy. Um, one of the one of the guys in the chat here, um, he just shared something that, you know, that was quite interesting is that, you know, uh, how Chinese perceive the government to be like more Chinese perceive China's government to be more democratic than Americans do. Right. That's an interesting thing, because I think when you look at Chinese citizens, OK, are, you know, when they look at, you know, one of the interesting things I, I noticed about is that it is much more difficult to be a Chinese government official than it is to be an American government official. A lot of people don't realize this, right? We, we think we think of the Communist Party as like, oh, look at these guys. They're working for the party. They're living this lavish lifestyle. No, it is incredibly difficult because if you if you don't deliver, you're out. I mean, you are. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I mean, if you get caught in a scandal, death sentence, you get, you know, life in prison. I mean, there are some very high stakes in being a member of the party. What, I mean, it's not some cushy job where you're just bankrolling and you've got, you know, oh, I'm, I'm siphoning millions off of here. I can do whatever I want. You've got to answer to the people and you've got to produce results. It's the only way that you can advance in the party. And that is the interesting thing, because that is not how the United States is. You can basically do nothing and you can just and what you do is you do siphon off. I mean, we have I mean, look at look at how Nancy Pelosi who, you know, I mean, on average, she's earning somewhere between one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand dollars a year on her salary. Now she's retired with a net worth of tens of millions of dollars. You know, I mean, hundred percent insider trading from Nancy Pelosi. I mean, she has milked the system. She has used lobbyists. I mean, she has made tens and tens of millions of dollars and and really leveraged her job as a um, you know politician in the United States. And that is the interesting thing is when you you know, it's very opposite. When you are a high ranking government official in China, when you get to a certain level after you retire, you're not allowed to go into the private sector because you have too much influence. You know, they don't allow that. They want a strict separation there. It's a very different system where kind of the whole reason that you become a U.S. politician, it's not to serve the people. It's to be able to leverage that. Something like Michael Pompeo, right? Like Michael Pompeo served as the secretary of state. Now he's retired. Well, what, what can I do? Well, you know what? I can fly to Taiwan. I can, you know, get a first class ticket over there, get paid 300,000 U.S. dollars to give a 30 minute speech and basically just talk a bunch of bull, you know, a bunch of BS that is just like, you know what? You know, I'm going to I'm going to take this very pro, uh, you know, Taiwan independent stance, which by which, by the way, you know, the vast majority of Taiwanese don't want that. They don't want independence. Um, you know, the vast majority of Taiwanese want the status quo. You know, they, they you know, there's a very few Taiwanese want to reunite with China. Very few Taiwanese want actual independence. It's about two percent on both of those sides. Those are the extremist views. Vast majority of Taiwanese right in the middle. They just it's like, hey. We don't we're, we're kind of doing our thing in Taiwan. We, you know, we've been we've been living like this under the threat of China's invasion for 50, 60 years now. But you know what? We're doing our thing and, and we just want life to continue. And that is something that people just do not realize in this country. And it's it's just it's really shocking, Alex, when I'm looking at presidential candidates, when it's like, hey, why are you why is China your number one thing that you're talking about? Right. It's it's what are you going to yeah. How are we going to fix the problems inside of this country? You've missed the assignment, Nikki Haley, 100 percent missed the assignment. And it's completely irresponsible for you as a president to be advocating a regime change in a sovereign country. Right. China right. has to figure out what China can do. If China is going to convert to a democracy, it might happen one day. You never know. Um, I mean, but it is going to come from the Chinese people. It's going to come from that government. There has to be a change. I'll be honest. There's, there's no way that China, you know, Chinese people are not in China thinking like, wow, I really wish we had a system like America. I really wish we had democracy like America. They, they Chinese people are not looking at America and envious of that situation. And, and I'm going to, I'm sorry, I'm going to go off on, um, you, you know, uh, I'm, so I'm kind of going off on a tangent here, but I, I do want to kind of put in one more point because a lot of people do say, you know, well, why is it that so many Chinese people are immigrating to the United States? You know, why, why, you know, why are so many Chinese people leaving China? I, I tell you an interesting story. This is a very interesting thing, Alex. When I went back to Shanghai, I was, I had a chance to um, take a lot of taxis. And right. what I noticed a very big change is when I was living in Shanghai, most of the sh taxi drivers were much older um, local Shanghainese people, let's say usually above the age of 60. On my recent trip back to Shanghai, most of them are much younger now, kind of between 20 to 30. And I was like, wow, this is interesting. Like I've never seen so many young people driving taxis. And I said, hey, are you from Shanghai? Because normally Shanghai taxi drivers are, are local. They all speak Shanghainese amongst each other. It's like, no, no, I'm from uh, Chongqing. No, I'm from, uh, you know, I'm from Anhui. 
I'm from different provinces, you know, and I said, wow, that's fascinating. Um, I said, you know, and, and they would ask me, where are you from? I'm from America. And, 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 and so I asked them, I said, uh, they said, oh, you know, I've always had an American dream. I've always would love to go to America. And I said, that's interesting. I said, I, I know that because I really believe that a lot of Chinese people do have an American dream. And, and I said, what is it about America? You know, what is it about? I said, do you wish that you could, is it because of America's government? Like, do you wish you had a democracy? Um, do you wish that you could vote for your government? Do you wish that you could, you know, become an American citizen so that you could vote for the president? Is that really the need? And it's like, no, it's, it really has nothing to do with the government. It's just that, you know, I see, for example, he's like, do you know what it's like to be, you know, a small fish in the world's largest pond? Like, like I'm a taxi driver in Shanghai. Like I don't make much money, right? Like it's just, it's hard to be a Chinese person competing against 1.4 billion people. I'm just kind of, I'm kind of looking at it like, the United States is, you know, a quarter of the size. So even if I'm a smaller fish in a smaller pond, maybe I got a chance at making a little bit more money. Like maybe even if I just go work at a Chinese restaurant in Chinatown, you know, maybe I could like make a little bit more money and save more money. It's just kind of more the opportunity to make a little bit more money. And so that's where I think people like, yeah, Chinese people are immigrating to the United States and they are coming over, but it's not because they feel like, oh, you know, uh, oh, thank God I'm in America now. It's I, I can, uh, you know, I can finally, I can become an American citizen and vote for my president. I don't think Chinese people really give a crap about that. You go back to Chinese people, they like making money, right? That's, 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 that's kind of their mindset here. And, you know, it's, it's, it's like, that's where their interest is. You know, it's just more like I can be a smaller fish in a much smaller pond. I mean, and, and it is, it's, it's just, it, as we know, you know, youth unemployment, very high in China right now, you know, you're in your mid twenties. It's a very hard you know, these people, you know, these guys are struggling. Like, they, like, how do you make it? How do you make it to where you can afford housing and things like that? And I think that's where, you know, people are still, in, you know, interested in that. So I just wanted to kind of add that perspective there because I, I'm, you know, obviously Chinese people are immigrating to the United States, but it's not, you know, our politicians want us to believe, well, they're immigrating here because of our democracy and because we have the best political system in the world. I don't think Chinese people really give a crap about that. They really don't. I mean, even even when I was in Canada and, you know, um, you know, I was living in Richmond, which, by the way, is a suburb of Vancouver, about 74 percent of the Chinese population uh, of the population in Richmond is Chinese descent. I mean, when it was time to vote, nobody voted. No one gave it. No one cared about voting in there. I mean, they didn't really they didn't get involved in Canadian politics. They had no interest in Canadian politics because it's just like, hey, we're in Richmond community We're you know, we got our kids in a good school. We like our quality of life here. But the interesting thing was, is they all of them had a very, you know, they love China as well. And they, every, and, you know, as soon as, you know, we have a two week spring break in, in Canada, as opposed to a one week in, in U.S., every you know two weeks spring break all of them went back to china it's like man i got to go back to china taobao's there you know traveling you know just like every everything is so convenient in china the convenience the lifestyle we love it like we love going back to china it's it's you know they still you know people are like well why are you immigrating well it's like well you know it's a great opportunity you know same reason why why did i immigrate to china you know why did i move to china as an expat right why, why would i leave the united states and do that why do hundreds of thousands of foreigners go to china you know it's opportunities and so i think that's what people you know really need to kind of understand on this thing thanks alex that's kind of went yeah, off no it. Uh, i want to add to that because Wait. you know if we take the top five countries that immigrate to the united states of course is mexico's number one philippines number two india's number three we don't see uh you know net migration Chinese actually leaving a country that maybe they feel unsafe in, uh, which we've seen over the last couple of years with, uh, you know, a lot of Asian hate crimes uh, that have happened throughout that country. Uh, homelessness, uh, skyrocketing mortgages. Uh, this all happens. Now, it's all fine and dandy for the Americans to say, hey, you know, look at how many Chinese are coming in. Well, first of all, you bring them into your universities. You charge them double the price. Uh, oh, well, a lot more than double, buddy. More, more well, like seven, double, seven, seven times. Okay. Seven, seven times. times. Right. Seven times. So, so this is a country that wants to target China and say, well, you know, they're migrating. Yeah, of course. But people migrate to the United Kingdom. They migrate to uh, France, Germany, England, European Union. I mean, this is a topic. This is a this is a soundbite for every country. Um, and we've got to remember the railway was built by the Chinese in Canada. Yep. And this coming from a country in the last couple of months has found drugs in its White House, a dead body 
in an ex-president's floating pond, Barack Obama, uh, the son of the president arrested on tax fraud and owning a, a firearm, which he shouldn't have done, something like that. <laughs> a prostitute that ended up in his underwear at the husband's home uh, of Nancy Pelosi, the house speaker. And they're arresting Donald Trump on three indictments. This is a country we're supposed to take serious. If any of those happened in other parts of the world, those governments would have been run out of town. And we're supposed to be showing compassion and lock the borders down. I mean, it's incredible. The hypocrisy, uh, you know, what set me off was watching that Nikki Haley video. I mean, this is just, as you say, a propaganda machine built up. Yeah, they're doing it. Ukraine is, Ukraine is the circus tour for them right now. Oh, we it got is. the biggest military in the world. You know what? I don't think so. And I'll tell you why. It's because America has left so much garbage in countries that they've had so unsuccessful missions. And nothing against veterans. Hey, veterans, yeah. my father was in the war. My grandfather died in the Second World War. Uh, you know, I have a military family there. I respect what people do for their commander in chief for the country. But this is a military that has seen many people die over senseless wars over the last, you know, three or four decades. Now they're sitting back in their armchair military, sitting there pumping, you know, we're talking staggering amounts of uh, military arms going to these countries. Yeah. And, I, and I'm going to tell you, Cyrus. They think they can bulldoze into the, some of these Southeast Asian countries and get away with it. I don't think so anymore because yeah. you're talking about a country like China that has built its military that has not been in conflicts in almost 50 years and is getting stronger, stronger, and stronger. And I know the audience is immediately going to jump out and say, yeah, but they have experience. Oh, yeah. How's that experience working out for you guys in the Ukraine right now? Uh, oh, training all these NATO troops. It's not happening. It's a, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. And I think, Alex, is it's... um. There's, there's so many good things. I think we've had a really good, uh, great stream today. And I'm just really happy we could talk about this thing because I want you to bring up that one slide, though, that um, can you bring up the slide that shows um, I want to reveal the, the answer. Who is America's greatest threat and bring up that one slide that shows like what Americans think? Who is the greatest is threat? It? Um, uh, that, that, the you, other one. Do you know what number it is? I don't. <laughs> the other one. Um, uh, the, not this one, right? We've already done that. We've done and we've done this one. How about that one? That's the one. That one? So okay. half of Americans name China as the greatest threat to the United States. Okay. But the answer is on that board. Okay. And it's, and it's, it, and it is the last one at the bottom there. It is the United States. 2% of Americans think that the U S poses the greatest threat to the, to the U S. So that's the right answer. The United <laughs> States biggest, you know, issue, the biggest hindrance, the biggest obstacle that the United States has is always going to be itself. And I think there's a video that I highlighted this uh, earlier, Alex, is that, you know, mm -hmm. we had a guy um, by the name of Richard Haas, who, um, you know, that's that's good. You can take that off the screen, buddy. Yeah. So Richard Haas, he has basically, I, I shared this in a video earlier that is really important. It was one when I talked about the French protest. And he said, Richard Haas said, look, for 20 years, he's been leading the number one think tank in America that is basically dictating foreign policy decisions inside this country. And Richard Haas said, after serving this for 20 years, I'm going to retire. And my biggest takeaway is that our biggest problem is the United States. And uh, that is quite a statement for uh, the, the, the director of a think tank that has been the number one influence into foreign policy decisions for the United States. And, and again, this is why I always I'm, I always say that I try to be as balanced and rational as possible because the reality is, is I'm, I'm looking at people like a Richard Haas. There's also another guy named Ryan Haas who is you know now, now the president of the Brookings Institute. You know, very, very good insights and much more objective into the U.S.-China relationship. You know, I mean, Ryan Haas wrote a great article talking about how we're making a very strategic blunder in regards to Taiwan because we're looking at Taiwan as an asset. Okay. And he said, look, Taiwan is not an asset that is under our control. Taiwan is merely an economic partner. We do business with Taiwan. 
We, we have a great relationship. Obviously, U.S.-Taiwan relationship is great. There's no doubt about that. No one's going to deny that. But we cannot look at them as an asset that we can control because doing that goes against the will of the Taiwanese people. You, you need to, you know, there are some people inside the United States government that are being very objective and rational. You look at their histories and their experience dealing with foreign policy. It's much better than someone like a Nikki Haley, even though she served on the United Nations. You know, she is a neocon. She is a, a huge Massive. China hawk that is that is just lacks the rational thinking, right? I mean, guys like Marco Rubio, Tom Cotton, these guys are just, they just want to go on your emotions and say a bunch of nonsense. But you actually look at some rational thinking and some people that really understand how complex this relationship is, you're going to be able to find some golden nuggets of wisdom. There are people in the United States government that do have the ability to think the brain and actually make some rational decisions in regard to this. You know, Ryan Haas with the Brookings Institute, I believe he's one of those guys that says that. But Richard Haas saying, look, our biggest problem is always going to be the United States. And the best thing that the United States can do, Alex, is if we really want to show the world that democracy is the best, we have to be the shining example. But our democracy is backsliding so fast. Our nation is so polarized in this country that we are effectively split down the middle, right? It's you're either Republican or you're Democrat, and both sides absolutely hate each other, absolutely hate each other. And that is a huge issue for the United States because, you know, uh, you know that basically means whoever is the president, if it's a, de a Democrat or Republican, half the country is going to absolutely hate them. And when Joe Biden is in office, the Republicans, their entire mission is let's block anything Joe Biden does. Because he's he's not our party, we don't like him. And as soon as Donald Trump or whoever other Republican comes to party, you know th that's the same thing the liberals are going to say. Let's block everything they try to do because we don't agree with them. So you constantly have this stalemate. Again, I want to say that one more time. There's not a country in the world that is looking at the United States right now and saying we want to emulate that government. We want to be like that government. That is a shining example of how our government can function. So if the U.S. really wants to be a positive force in the world, if we really want to encourage China to be a democracy, well, give China a reason to do so. Because right now, if I'm Chinese, I'm not looking at the U.S. and saying like, oh, that's a model country I want to be like. They're looking at it from the perspective. And this is an interesting thing, right? This is why, for example, why are people moving to Nevada where I'm at right now? Well, one, because of our state, we have we have no state income tax. People are moving to Nevada, Texas, and Florida. They're moving to Republican red states because basically the liberal governments are destroying cities around the world. LA, Portland, Seattle, all of these very, very liberal you know, cities are, you know, California, which is the most, probably the most blessed place in the world. I mean, California is just phenomenal. Now, the beach, the coastline, the weather, I mean, it should be the best state in the United States. Mm -hmm. And it's a great, and I love going to California. I go there for holiday because it's, it's, it's an absolutely beautiful stuff. I have, um, you know, aunt that lives in um, Laguna Beach, one of the most beautiful places in the entire planet. Absolutely stunning. But it, you can't live there. It, you know, the politics have destroyed California because of just this crazy liberal thinking and the taxes are insane. I mean, it's just it is sad to see the state of California. And there is, you know, nine out of 10 people that are moving to Las Vegas are coming from California. And, and if they're not coming to Nevada, they're going to Texas, they're going to Florida, they're going to places because in these that that is a good advantage of the United States is that if you go to individual states, you know, the government is less involved in your life. But I got to be honest, Alex, I, I mean, I talk to Americans like, hey, what do you think of our government? It sucks. I hate it. It's garbage. <laughs> our politicians are terrible. No one likes the government here. Nobody likes the government in the United States. No one is proud of our government. No one. No one. Uh, do you trust the United States government? <laughs> are you out of your mind? Why would we trust them? <laughs> do you think they have the best our best interest at heart? Not a chance. So it's, it's very interesting where, you know, if you ask Americans, do, do does your politicians, do they serve you? Absolutely not. Do you have trust in them? Absolutely not. Do you like your government? Absolutely not. You see Americans going to to states that have the least government influence. And again, like what I see, what's positive here is, for example, if you open up a, a corporation in the state of Nevada, you can you know legally avoid more taxes. You can write business expense off. You don't have to pay state income tax. So you can leverage that. And that's what people are doing. That's an advantage of the United States that you know you can try to go to states where there's less government influence. And and the people that I have found that are very successful in the United States, they basically want nothing to do with the government. And they just, it's just like, just let me live my life and just leave me alone. Cause I've, I've lost complete trust in you and just leave me the heck alone. 
And, and it is a very different thing where, you know, where we see China's government, at least like, again, like I, I interviewed a guy named Brian Linden, who has lived in China since 1983, originally from LA, American. He's doing amazing things in Western China. He has partnered, he's built hotels. He is, you know, he's, he's like, look, like I'm living in the rural parts of China. You know who gets involved? The local mayors, the local community. You know, I mean, it's it's a much different system. And again, I'm not here to try to portray China's government as this model government. I'm not trying to say it doesn't have its problems. But what people don't realize is, is that it's much more, it's actually very similar to the United States in one regard. In China, the, the local government plays a very big role. If you are in a local village out in Western China, you're not dealing with politics from Beijing. You're going to your local mayor or your local village chief and you're it's like hey we don't have enough electricity here you know what like let's solve that problem hey we're not we don't have enough water to water our plants we need better irrigation systems that's where you're going and those those issues are like hey we need irrigation like let's let's sort this thing out and you know i remember daniel dumro you know he went into xinjiang and he went to this village where that's like they didn't have a good water solution and then it's like okay we're gonna have an 18 month plan to build this new thing and then they're like, well, wait a minute. If they don't have proper water, that's like, it's not an 18-month project. Send in double the amount of workers. Get it done in six months because this is a priority. People need water. Like if this is if they're not having proper water, this is a massive issue. Get this thing sorted, not now, but right now. You know, that like we're, you know, and so again, it's just I want people to have that needs to be brought to the table, Alex. We need to discuss mm -hmm. that as well. We need people to understand that it's a lot more complex. And there's a lot more nuances that are there. It's not Xi Jinping running the show as a one man show. You know, that you want a government like that, it's called North Korea. You know, Kim Jong un, he runs the tables, he does anything that he wants. And you see the results. Look at North Korea, it's the most censored, the most sanctioned, the most completely cut off from the outside world. Nobody in North Korea knows what the heck is going on anywhere in the world. That's a very different model. That is unfortunately what many people in America think. They think that China is like that. Well, Chinese people have no idea what America is like. Are you kidding me? They watch American TV. They watch American shows. I mean, they travel to America. Chinese people go there all the time. I mean, it's it's amazing, you know, how many cities Chinese people can rat off and know about. And, you know, the, your average Chinese knows a lot more about the United States than the United States citizen knows about China. I mean, we don't know anything about China. And, you know, it's again, it's this is why I'm really happy to, you know, call you a close friend a, um, a colleague, a partner, whatever you want to call it. I mean, we do a lot of these two videos together. We're going to be mm -hmm. back on the ground in China together uh, here relatively soon, I hope. And, you know, Alex, uh, it's been a great stream today. But again, yeah. I think it's just trying to be a little bit more rational. I want to thank everybody in the comment section. Um, I did have a couple of super chats come in. Um, I, I, I've, it's been a while. So let me just give them a quick shout out here because uh, it's Jacqueline, a mom, sent in a nice thank you emoji. Really appreciate that. And also, uh, uh, Liu Ray May, uh, thank you so much. And, and again, this is a, a tweet that I sent out. Go back to that one, Alex. I, I keep it there; it's fine. Um, you know, this is a really good one. Um, as recently as 2017, China wasn't even on the list of countries Americans considered enemies. Then there was a concentrated effort to add China, move it to number one. Right when that the intelligence agency started feeding media negative stories about China from 2018, that is, of course, when the Donald Trump trade war happened. We saw all of these tensions start ramping up. And now you go back to the, you know, the other slide there, Alex. I mean, this is really interesting, right? 2017, everybody's fearing North Korea. And now you go back to here. This is my tweet. 50% of Americans now see China as the greatest threat. Just six years ago, it wasn't even on the list. This just shows us how big uh, uh, you know, Trump's trade war and the media's anti-China coverage has been. And, you know, I put a little sheep emoji there because that is unfortunately <laughs> for most most Americans, you know, we are these kind of blind sheep that are being led down, you know, and really fed whatever we want to do. And it's it's a, and this is why I think it's so important to have more rational thinking. Another, I'm going to end it on this one, Alex, and I actually have a video coming out tomorrow morning talking specifically about the microchips because you have mm. microchips is it's amazing. China is really outsmarting the U.S. here. I mean, they are they are really you know, it's, a, it's incredible the strategy that they've released, but we are seeing Korea, we're seeing Taiwan, we're seeing Japan all come out and say, look, you cannot sanction this. We just had the three largest microchip CEOs, NVIDIA, Qualcomm, and Intel. Those three CEOs went to Joe Biden's office in the White House and said, look, you are destroying the local chip market here in America. You are destroying our companies because you are cutting off, us. you're cutting us off. You're basically sanctioning American companies. <laughs> you, you know, the U.S. is self-censoring or self-sanctioning our own companies to sell to their number one customer. 
And it's quite simple. Like, this is an interesting insight. I, I break it all down in tomorrow's video. So make sure you tune in tomorrow morning. I got a brand new video that's going to launch. And it's going to, and it's basically in, Intel saying, you know, we want to launch, we want to build the world's biggest chip manufacturing hub in, um, in, uh, in Ohio. But if you cut off our revenue to China, there's no need to build that anymore. So, it, you know, we're making America weaker with our own policies and stuff like that. So anyways, that's all I got for today. Thank you, everybody. We've had an amazing stream. Really appreciate your support. Thanks, Cyrus. I appreciate that. You, I guess uh, we'll head out from here. We'll put a bit of music on. You guys take care. Uh, I got a big video coming out. Uh, the world's prison system. Ooh. That's going to be quite interesting. You guys take care. From all of us here, Let's Talk China. You guys have yourself a fantastic day. Take care.